We've got a lot of ground to cover in today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the Train the Trainer OER Adoption Workshop, and we're delighted you're all here today. Um, we thank you for the work that each and every one of you does to make education more accessible, more equitable, and more affordable through open education. Whether you're joining us from home or your workplace or your car, as someone was yesterday, uh, or a cafe, uh, we, we know it can be difficult to block out three hours of uninterrupted time, but we encourage you to stay as present and as engaged uh, as possible. I know, you know, the session is being recorded. Um, I always have good intentions of going back and reviewing miss sessions and i've got a whole folder full of things that i need to go back and rewatch so we we just encourage you to to uh try and tune out as many distractions as possible and um and engage with us as we we learn how to deliver these workshops to faculty so uh i am cheryl casey the open education librarian at the university of arizona and I want to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, there are 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. And I'll pass things over to my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be with here, be with you transitioning from most of us. Um, I think morning to afternoon. My name is Maggie Mapes. I use she, her. Um, I am an introductory course director in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Kansas. So that means I oversee all of our public speaking courses, which you'll learn has given me some interesting and intricate knowledge of the way open can really assist in innovating our curriculum at a broader level. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the University of Kansas is located on the ancestral homelands of several tribal nations that include the Kaw, the Osage, and the Shawnee. And the University of Kansas occupies those lands that were forcibly ceded in a series of treaties with tribal nations. And the Open Education Network really believes that it's our responsibility to acknowledge the people of these lands, the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations, and the histories of disposition. And this, tra this tradition territory was not a singular property with borderlines, but rather maintained by tribal people as stewards. Cheryl, would you want to introduce any other and amazing parts of yourself this morning? I, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and as the Open Education Librarian, I coordinate with our bookstore and faculty partners. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, some of the other things that we, we do, but thanks for that introduction. Uh, we also want to talk about who we are, and uh, collectively, we are a community of higher ed institutions that are working together to transform education to be more equitable, affordable, and accessible. Um, the Open Education Network is housed at the University of Minnesota's College of Education and Human Development. Uh, it is not a vendor. Next slide, please. It encompasses all types of institutions. And as Dave Ernst shared yesterday at the annual meeting update, um, all 50 states are now uh, represented in the network, including uh, or in addition to Australia and Canada. Uh, so it has expanded internationally. So there are individual institutions, consortia, uh, tribal colleges, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions uh, were really diverse, um, which gives us a lot of strengths. And we are all about action and collaboration and the common good. So we're focused on action that advances open education in ways that are shareable, collaborative and sustainable. Uh, we do this by sharing the experiences and expertise of our community in ways that support our members and the common good. And as a community, we're working together to help everyone in higher education. Uh, one of the best examples of our efforts to support the common good is the Open Textbook Library. Uh, 
This is my go-to resource for helping faculty find OER and complete textbooks. And it's been amazing to watch its growth um, over the, the last several years. Um, you know, it contains uh, over a thousand textbooks that have been reviewed by faculty and freely available to anyone, anywhere, anytime. All right, so one of the greatest things about being part of the Open Education Network is that you are part of a community that does all of these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have strategies that are action-based. Um, we focus on encouraging textbook adoptions. Um, there's support for publishing uh, and, you know, Karen support and others support the Pub 101 program, which has been really valuable to me. Uh, we have a lot of best practices that we share that you can learn from uh, with guides and templates and the expertise that everyone shares in the uh, Google group. Uh, shared solutions like the Open Textbook Library and slide decks that you can customize, the data collection in the hub. Uh, and, and action. So there are working groups. I was involved in one several years ago on inclusive access and how to talk to faculty and campus partners about that. Um, mentioned the mailing list. Of course, there's uh, this event, OEN Engage. And I just love being part of this community. It's, it's full of so many generous, wise, <laughs> amazing people, some of my favorite people in the whole world. So we're really glad that you're here and part of this community. OK, our format today, the session is being recorded. Uh, as I said, it, this is three hours long, uh, and we will have a scheduled break in the middle. Um, please stay muted in, until or unless you're invited to speak. Um, the video, the transcripts and slides will be sent to all registrants and to the OEN Google group after the event has concluded. Uh, videos will also be posted on the Community Hub and the 2023 OEN Engage YouTube playlist. Uh, thank you to our ASL interpreters who are here today. Uh, as an access member, if you do unmute yourself to speak, um, please say your name before speaking so that everyone can identify who is talking. We have a lot of time at the end of today's session for questions. So if you have a if a question comes up to you as as we go, please just uh, put it in the chat. Uh, Dave and others will be keeping track of those. And We'll try to get to as many questions at the end as we can. Um, the chat is also a place to submit comments and uh, reactions. We are committed to providing throughout this session a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at uh, a link that Maggie is going to add to the chat. And the hashtags for today are OEN uh, for or for OEN Engage in general are hashtag OEN Engage 23 and hashtag more connection. And you can join us on Twitter at at sign open ed underscore network. So overall for our goal today. We want to equip you with tools, techniques, and strategies to build and sustain open education initiatives at your own institution or on your own campus. Next slide, please. Um, during our time together, we'll be uncovering barriers to open textbook adoption, talking about strategies for raising awareness, educating, and engaging practicing successful strategies for responding to those tough questions about open education, discussing ways to incentivize um, faculty engagement with open textbooks, answering your questions. Uh, this train the trainer model really evolved from a, a scalability standpoint. Um, when, uh, when 
the University of Arizona joined the Open Education Network in 2015, we were fortunate to be able to have Dave Ernst and Sarah Cohen come to campus. And then COVID happened and uh, membership exploded. And we've really uh, switched to this train the trainer model to give you kind of a format and a slide deck that you can customize and use on your own uh, campus or your, your own institution. All right. So of course our focus is open education and we just wanna briefly describe what we mean by open uh, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, the definition of open tends to be free plus permissions. And that, that free aspect, I, I tend to portray as free to use because OER aren't free to make, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, free to use, uh, the, there's no paywall, that's the key. Uh, and then the other part that's important are the permissions. Uh, so you can copy, share, edit, mix, keep, use, and it's the Creative Commons licenses that are often the key to those five R permissions. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's not just a, a free thing that you can get through the library. It's being able to customize and and keep a copy and do a lot of things that our free library license or free to use library license materials don't allow us to do. So on the next slide, why open removes financial barriers for all students, facilitates the free exchange of knowledge. Uh, you know, you think about all that's happened with COVID and, and scientific discoveries and, and what's possible without paywalls. It gives more control to faculty. That academic freedom is so important on my campus and emphasizing to faculty that having the option to, to do OER or to practice open pedagogy expands their academic freedom by giving them more choices. Uh, it can be used to innovate pedagogy and sharing is scalable and that scalability is so important. Uh, why textbooks? So it hits a major pain point, textbook costs and faculty understand textbooks. Um, they're, they're probably used to using them in their course. They know how to adopt them. And in terms of faculty effort, uh, adopting a, a textbook or even adapting the textbook um, keeps that effort at a minimum. Textbooks can provide content for a complete or nearly complete course. So that's the why. Um, you know, given all of that, uh, you know, and how awesome. OER are, <laughs> why isn't everybody using them? Well, there, there are some good reasons for that. And uh, there are some barriers to faculty adoption of open textbooks, and you've probably run into them in your work. Um, we want to do this activity with Menti to talk about the barriers that stand in our way. It's important to identify them and to surface them so that we can address them and come up with solutions. Share some of the barriers that you've heard from faculty to adopting open textbooks. Time, oh, I see time all over here, lack of ancillary materials, promotion and tenure concerns, the labor required, uh, the know-how. Uh, many faculty don't know what OER are. Um, you know, I run into that a lot. Uh, faculty will say, oh yeah, I'm using OER. It will turn out to be maybe a library licensed ebook. In one case, it was a pirated textbook on a blog site in India. Um, they may not know where to find OER, or they may not know how to customize, say, a PDF, if that's the only format it exists in. Money, I see um, lack technology barriers, 
reticence to give up favorite texts, uh, not knowing where to find them, yes. Quality issues, concerns about that. Uh, burnout, yeah, demands on faculty time. Uh, budget, maybe not having an OER budget, I can relate to that. Uh, copyright questions, not knowing what they can use, yes. Uh, OER not being available for all courses, um, you know, not much yet for higher level courses. Again, the online homework and ancillary materials, uh, reliability questions. Yes. Inclusive access policies. Uh, we are a heavy user of inclusive access on our campus and are getting ready to roll out um, an equitable access style program this fall. So um, that, that can be a concern. How do you incentivize faculty to choose OER or um, you know, free to use materials if, uh, if there's an equitable access style program on your campus? Uh, it, recognition, another. Uh, transferability concerns. Yeah, thank you for sharing these. Uh, these are all real challenges. And uh, as, as Maggie and I have done these sessions and other trainers have done these sessions across the country, we've found that there are real similarities in the answers, no matter where we do the training. Um, so, so the good news is that these are very common challenges. Uh, the additional good news is that there are a lot of solutions to these challenges. And so now I will pass things off to Miggy to talk about some of those solutions. Thanks, Cheryl. And thanks, everyone, for um, really thinking about what those barriers are. Just like Cheryl mentioned, the good news is that not only does the OEN provide you with tons of resources, but that the session today, as we continue to have conversations and really the entirety of OEN Engage is meant to assist in brainstorming ways to think through those potential challenges. Um, and this three kind of prong approach, which is increasing awareness, increasing education and increasing adoption or engagement, excuse me, education, awareness um, and engagement are really ways that the OEN has used and tested and demonstrated that they can be super beneficial in assisting to think through some of those barriers that you've just brainstormed. And I, I want to note that these don't aren't, aren't kind of separate and they aren't linear. When we think about awareness, education, and engagement, it's important that we think about them all working in tandem. Because one thing I realized when I began my position as a faculty member is that I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Folks don't know what they don't know. So we really want to raise awareness around issues of open education or barriers that are prohibiting open education. Um, we also want to educate folks about why, why those barriers, why that problem matters, and really help folks to engage with the issues that we've particularly, um, that we've articulated. So when we talk about awareness, education, and engagement, what do these really mean? How do we actually use and deploy them? So what we're going to do is kind of walk through how this strategy is deployed through, a, through the kind of faculty workshop. And we call this the um, faculty workshop strategy. And what that means is um, the faculty workshop strategy really uses this well-rounded approach, again, of awareness, education, and engagement. So how can we integrate the open education library? How can we educate faculty about not only issues their students are facing, but open as a means of alleviating some of those problems? Um, and then how can we get faculty to engage? So this is overall the workshop strategy that I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth with you about. First and foremost, when we're talking about awareness, um, we really want to make sure that people know the open textbook library is something that exists. I know many of you know what the open textbook library is, but the library was launched by the Open Education Network in April of 2012 and has been growing ever since. The open textbook library is a place that is really an archive um, that, that houses all of these different open textbooks. So, if, so it, it's, a, it's a place for faculty to look. And it has been visited more than 60,000 times a month. 
Um, there are over a, a thousand textbooks that have been reviewed in that library as well. And so again, as an awareness strategy, our goal is to let faculty know just that the open textbook library is something um, that can exist or that does exist. I um, mean, here we see the, the, the kind of very cool 10 year sticker, um, but this is how it looks if you all haven't had an opportunity. So one way that we can, a very simple way that we can increase awareness for faculty um, is just by helping them understand that the open textbook library um, is something, is a resource at their disposal. And one question that we often get is, where do these books come from? Um, and we want to always make sure that we help folks understand that oftentimes books within that library are usually funded through different initiatives. Sometimes they're created by independent authors. There are discipline collectives, other places, but almost and entirely they are created, supported, and funded with the goal of creating really affordable um, resources for folks to be able to choose from. So the open textbook library is one of our strategies to increase awareness about open textbooks. We also want folks on our campus and in our communities to really be educated about why open textbooks are things that exist or why open is something that they could institute within their campus or even in their own classrooms. And that's where the kind of workshop strategy is really important. So when we think about this kind of overall training today, the train the trainer, one of our goals is to make you all a little bit more comfortable and familiar with hosting faculty workshops on your own campus as a means to transition them from not just an awareness about some, some Thing that's important or happening or that they could be involved in, but also to really educate them about the components of what we mean by open and in particular open textbooks. And our faculty workshops through the Open Education Network is around 60 to 90 minutes, sort of depending on the amount of folks you have, the amount of engagement you have. And that faculty workshop really embeds strategies of awareness, education, and engagement. So what we're going to do um, is um, actually show you our faculty workshop. Um, and what that means is I recorded um, this workshop a couple of weeks ago with a group of faculty members at a university in Texas. Um, and that means that when we're, when we're focusing on faculty, right, faculty is our main audience. And the goal of our faculty workshop is to help identify issues or barriers that students and faculty are facing when they're trying to engage with different curricular materials. We also want to provide literacy and language around what open means to audiences, because it's not just about getting faculty to adopt open textbooks, though that's really important. It's also really helping ourselves and other people in our communities feel comfortable in engaging relevant, ongoing, nuanced, and challenging discussions about our curricular choices and about open as a strategy that can really assist us in addressing some of those barriers. Um, and I'll also note that a really great benefit of the faculty workshop on its own that's provided to you by the Open Education Network is that embedded in it addresses many of the barriers that you all brainstormed earlier, because by helping increase awareness and by educating audience members about what open is, about different kinds of barriers that students are facing, it really assists implicitly and explicitly and helping answer some of the questions um, like, you know, uh, how, where are ancillary materials? What do we mean by open? How can we assist faculty in understanding where they can look? So again, we're going to watch um, this faculty workshop together. It's around 60 minutes. Um, and I'm going to a couple times throughout the workshop stop and really pull us back to help you understand why, uh, why are we making that argument? Why are we pointing faculty to that particular resource? Um, before I kind of start and hit play here, you are watching me narrate the workshop. So we're gonna get kind of meta here. You're watching me, we're watching me again um, as we sort of do this workshop. And I, what I really wanna note is I have presented this faculty workshop now, I'm not sure, but many, 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 many times to different faculty audiences. And while the OEN is amazing, we're providing you tons of resources to be able to effectively do that workshop um, on your campuses. As a presenter, I feel the most connected to and motivated by the content when I'm really talking about my own experiences. So as you listen to this faculty workshop, um, you can also try to find some places and spaces for your own story. Because when we're talking with faculty members, when we're connecting with them, that's how we can really elevate the workshop and really reconnect us to the content with those participants. So again, I'm going to start here. Um, 
I'm going to actually start at around the five minute mark of the presentation because the faculty workshop begins the same way our workshop today started with a little bit of information about who I am, who the Open Education Network is. And so I'm going to start us off here um, and let me know if you have any questions and I will stop and pull us out um, a few times if needed. people of those lands and to prioritize and support the recognition and sovereignty of all indigenous people and communities. Of course, though, as we all know, land acknowledgements are not enough and thinking for us about our own pedagogical choices and inclusivity are priorities both for the open education institution, um, open education network and also for myself. Now that we've had a little bit of a kind of top level introduction, this is what we're going to be doing today with our training. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. We're going to ask ourselves, what are some of the key problems that we're trying to address? What are open textbooks? And in particular, how might open textbooks just be one avenue, one additional tool that we can place in our toolkit as we attempt to address some of those major barriers or obstacles that unfortunately lead to exclusivity in education? Um, there will absolutely be time throughout for questions. Um, if you have something popped up that doesn't seem to be at the exact right moment, please write it down and I'll do my best in particular to leave a, a bigger chunk of time at the end so that we can really chat with one another, especially since it seems like some of y'all um, are, of course, colleagues who, who have some of those same similar goals. And it would actually really help me um, here in the chat if you could just type and let me know what is your background or experience with open textbooks or open education so just write new if you're brand new maybe you're interested you've got the grant but you haven't really done anything with open textbooks or open educational resources just write new in the chat there if you've thought about adopting an open textbook right maybe um, thinking and if you have already adopted maybe you've already started to write then you can write um, yes that you have Okay, so we've got some new folks who are sharing in the chat, someone who has already adopted, ready to adopt, sort of new, okay, in that kind of maybe category, have, have adopted some kind of open campus resources, amazing, starting to think about it, adoption for the fall, okay, this is excellent. Um, it looks like we have kind of a span of folks, and I like to do it not just for my own um, knowledge gathering, but also because you all are going to be your best resource on campus as you continue to move forward and think about the integration of open resources. Um, and so what's working? Those of you who, again, have already adopted or who have tried other, other kinds of quote unquote free resources can help one another as you're thinking about some barriers, um, problem, problem shooting, uh, you know, thinking about how you can integrate your learning management system that's on campus. All of those are, are things that you'll be able to do together. I'm also hopeful that by the time we end in the training that this training really is meant for folks who have a lot of different diverse experiences with open education because we're not just interested in understanding the problem and the solution we're also really interested in familiarizing ourselves with the language and vocabulary of open education so that if you have an issue or a problem you know where to go searching and also so that we can start to advocate on campuses and begin some of those conversations for ourselves so even if you're new welcome excellent this will be for you if you've actually adopted or even thought about writing this workshop will also be helpful and I'm going to kind of piggyback on that by also asking that you um, kind of stay in the chat there and just share with me if you can um, think of it. Um, I know, again, it's it's the summer. I want to start asking, you know, what brings you here? And I don't mean here as in the training. I mean here as in education, higher education. What motivated you or what motivates you? I know we can get caught in the weeds. I've been feeling very in the weeds this week already, and it's only Tuesday. But what what really motivated you to begin the work within education that pulled you into this realm? Just share a sentence with me or so a few words. Mm, yes, equity. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Absolutely. Witnessing dreams come true and being around the energy of people learning. Absolutely. Right. So thinking and understanding their equity issues and really thinking about education as that space to do something, helping the next generation, the desire to help people reach their potential. Yes, absolutely. And continue to share um, as you kind of think you might be really connecting with some of these also. Uh, I think one thing we can see pretty quickly is that oftentimes we have a belief that education matters, that when we're able to create education for folks, that it can lead to better community organizing. It makes people better people in the world. Right? 
Um, and the UN Declaration of Human Rights can really help us as we think about these principles because it, it states that higher education shall be ex equally accessible to all. So if we believe that education is something that can be profound, that can help folks and community members reach their potential, help them meet their kind of dreams, then innately it means that we have to have a value in accessibility and creating education that is accessible. When I first think about this kind of quote, though, often I can be guilty of only thinking about how accessibility translates to a physical space. So yes, we should have higher education be equitably, um, equitable and accessible, and that means there should be a place or a space where students can go to have education. But what we really know, and I'm sure what many of you realized and I experienced during COVID, is that there are so many other barriers to accessibility other than just the kind of physical place or space um, of education. So when we talk about access, we're really talking about questions of inclusivity and social justice. So we all believe in the transformative potential of education, that everyone should have access to inclusive education. But of course, we also know that we don't always live up to that value, right? And unfortunately, we can see a problem. I'm going to stop here, um, and I, I'm a little bit, I hope I'm a little bit explicit here, but one, one thing that's always been important to me as I transition into the faculty workshop is, again, that moment of connecting faculty to ask us, what are we doing? Why are we staying motivated? And the UN Declaration of Human Rights is a really great way to really ground everyone in the purpose of higher education and remind us that our goal is educational equity to get us all on the same page. I find that particularly important because you'll notice we're going to transition here into some problems, some difficulties as we think about not living up to that standard of inclusivity and accessibility. So for me as a faculty member, I can feel overwhelmed if I'm told um, this is just something um, else for you to do. So it's helpful, again, when you start the workshop, I think, to remind them what are some of the broad ways that can connect us all and continue to keep us motivated before transitioning into the kind of problem section. Partially demonstrated um, from data in this graph. And so what this graph shows is um, over beginning in the early 90s, how across all 50 states, um, there has been some changes to the amount of funding that has been used to support education. So that top kind of orange line is state funding. And what you'll notice is, of course, um, there's been a reduction in access to those funds. What it's led to then is that purple line, which is tuition funding. So as state funding has reduced, that the, the burden, the shift for paying for education has, has really moved to students. So when we compare the portion of costs that students had to contribute in 1993 to today, that, that financial on, uh, the financial load on students has doubled. We can see this at a state level too. Like I'd mentioned, I'm at the University of Kansas um, and likely for you all as well, right? We see some even more drastic at times. Um, reliance on those tuition fundings. In Kansas, our arrows are, you know, our lines are crossed, right? We've had to have tuition funding really drastically make up for this. Um, and so we know that students are suffering, that we're requiring students more and more to make up that financial gain. We experience it as faculty and staff, right? We know, we hear your professional funds are dwindling, right? There are going to be more budget cuts. We have to have salary savings. We can't be refilling those positions. So there's a problem related to that kind of financial load. And because we have experience with it ourselves as faculty and, and staff, it means that we can better empathize with how that burden is truly affecting students. Um, and, you know, we know that it is. You can see the impact of that just when we consider this story on NPR. And it's from 2017, so even it's pre-COVID, we know much of this has been exacerbated given COVID. But what this looked at is a study at the University of Wisconsin that looked at food and housing vulnerability among students. And we know, right, that our students are, quote unquote, living like students. They're eating ramen, right? They're having to kind of make some sacrifices. But unfortunately, those things are becoming exacerbated and students' um, very, very basic needs aren't being met. I think a lot about this quote from Sarah Golded Robb, who wrote, quote, students, they're working and borrowing and sometimes still falling so short that they're going without having their basic students need met. As a teacher, and with that that kind of value of inclusive education, um, when we think about that kind of shared value, it makes me wonder, right, how can we teach without first being attuned to students' basic needs? 
Um, we know some of these uh, problems are exacerbated because college food banks, for example, are popping up all over campus. And while that's an incredible resource, we have to ask ourselves, what's motivated from 2012 to now, such a huge increase in the necessity of those food banks. In 2012, there were only 13 members of the College and University Food Bank Alliance, 13 members. In 2021, there are over 700 members right, trying to kind of make up for some of these issues that students are having because of the financial load. So when we talk about access to higher education, we have to acknowledge that college is expensive and that alone makes it less accessible for many folks. We can see here right, that these are kind of the major expense categories for students. I'm sure many of you have seen these lists before. Um, and no one is asking me about many of these categories, but which of these do you think, any guess, that we'll be spending most of our time really focusing on for our kind of next hour together? Of all of these, which category are we gonna be spending the most time thinking about? We're gonna be talking about books and supplies, and that's because it's something that often faculty and staff can do something about. So even if tuition is free or low cost, there are still other substantial costs that students face. And so I know you're wondering, okay, but what exactly are students paying for books? What are they really paying? Um, and we know the answer to that um, because the federal government does mandate that we have to do some mandatory cost of attendance for certain categories and books or supplies are one of those. And so overall students are told that they should budget between 1240 and 1440 overall for books and supplies for y'all for this next year, students have been told $1,500 is what they should budget for books or supplies. Now, here's the thing. Um, this is not what students are actually spending. What they're actually spending is more like $400 per year on books. If you could guess, and you can unmute or in the chat, what do you think makes up for this difference? Over $1,000, the substantial difference between what they're calculating, this is what you should be spending versus what students are actually spending. Yes, absolutely, right? They're not kind of buying the books. Because here's something I kind of learned. Students are pretty savvy. And because of that financial load, oftentimes they're having to make difficult choices. Some, one of those choices might be that they don't buy the book. One of those might be that they delay purchasing until after financial aid happens, or they're sharing a book with someone, right? Maybe they're illegally downloading it. Unfortunately, though, those choices, there are risks associated with those choices, especially more and more. So for example, if a student doesn't buy the book 10 years ago, of course, that would have affected the ability for them to participate in the class. But now when we see an increase in prevalence of access codes, where if students don't buy the book, it then means they can't take the quizzes. It means that they can't do any of the homework. It really, really increases the risks for those students. Right? And I mention that because um, students aren't lazy. Right? If they don't have a book, it's not necessarily because they don't wanna be there. And that's something I had to grapple with. I would have students on the first day of class come to me and say, oh, Dr. Nibs, do I really need the textbook? And I'd think, well, of course you need the textbook. Why would I assign a book that you don't need? What kind of question is that? And until I really started to think about this issue, the financial issue or the burden that textbooks can really place on students, until I was aware of that, I didn't truly understand that they weren't asking because they didn't care about the class. They were asking because they were having to make choices often about if they could buy the book and when they absolutely had to purchase it. And, you know, we know that regardless of how much they are actually spending on course materials, that the cost is really impacting them. And this is an, a really, really interesting survey because during March and April of 2018, more than 21,000 students participated in a student textbook and course materials survey. And what that survey asked students was, in your academic career, has the cost of required textbooks caused you to? And so again, um, we know, just like we mentioned in the chat, we're not probably surprised by the top. 64% of students saying, well, I just didn't purchase the book, or maybe I couldn't take all the classes I wanted. I didn't register for a course. And what the survey is also telling us is that at the bottom, right, 17% of students have failed a course because they weren't able to afford the cost of that required book or had to withdraw from the course, drop or earn a poor grade. So for me, this is really interesting. The survey is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is that it really 
makes a connection between the financial burden and academic success. It isn't just that that extra $50 or that extra $100 is a financial burden to them, though it is. And in fact, at the University of Kansas in the libraries, we did something a, a while back where we asked students to share cho financial choices they had to give up or difficult choices they made because they needed to purchase a textbook. And many students shared things like, um, I couldn't afford my cat anymore. I couldn't afford food, right? I couldn't afford daycare. So we know also that there are issues, the financial issues, but this demonstrates to us a clear connection to academic success. So that's one that's really important for us to understand. There is academic impact to the financial load. Um, and the second like I, that I like to mention to faculty is that when we look at data like that, we can really understand that, there, that we should and could incentivize faculty to adopt open textbooks that would be better for our classes and our departments. This data shows us that we are losing students do, uh, having you know, lower enrollment numbers because of the educational resources that we might be integrating. Um, and so students not registering for our courses or dropping courses, these are conversations that we can have with our department chairs, for example, about how we should or could have more conversations about the impact that our financial choices are having on students and their ability to participate within our majors. But there are other educational equity issues outside of affordability that affects students' academic performance and classroom experiences. Because inaccessible classrooms, including inaccessible classroom materials, are also exclusive to a lot of student populations. And this is where we like to talk a little bit about a kind of sense of belonging that students can feel in the classroom. Or I, will, I often talk about this, as, as you may have heard it talked about, as the hidden curriculum. So we've talked a little bit about students having to shoulder the burden of tuition costs and textbooks and the academic impact that those barriers have. But it can also affect students, whether or not they kind of know the rules of the game, if they feel that they're part of a culture of belonging on campus or not. So this quote reads, quote, racially minoritized and first generation students at four year institutions are less inclined to feel that same sense of belonging compared to their peers at two year institutions. We know, for example, that students who have access to the rules of the game, who might know the hidden curriculum, which includes things like, where can I borrow a textbook? Does the library have the book on course reserve? Who do I ask if I need assistance? Is there support on campus? All of that can contribute to a sense of belonging. Do I see myself in the educational materials that are provided to me? Do those materials match the community and experiences of where we are geographically? Um, and students without some of those kind of knowledge base can fail to be included, which of course can have short and long-term consequences because they feel perhaps right, like they aren't being seen. So yes, the problem when we think broadly about our educational landscape as it intersects with resources, yes, there's a financial barrier. Yes, that reduces student success. Um, and we also want to investigate the kind of educational legacy and flexibility that traditional educational resource models provide versus open educational resources and the models that those might be able to provide as we think about questions of inclusivity, both about the financial barriers and also broadly speaking about inclusivity um, as it relates to resources. So spend a little bit of time then thinking about that problem or a few so I'm going to pop back out here just for a moment to point out a couple of things. We have finished the sort of first section of that faculty workshop. And one thing you'll notice, um, as someone who studies communication, I also I can find it helpful to really think about what is the trajectory of this faculty presentation. And what you just watched is the kind of first section where we really are talking about the problems that students are facing right now. The best way to connect with your audience to make that more effective is to take something broad right, and really try to localize it to what's happening in their state, on their campus, and even within their own classrooms. So that's why it's important as you think about applying this faculty workshop to your own campus to be able to say, yes, um, you know, we have some increased financial burden that are happening to students overall in the United States, but let's really focus on what's happening in our state. Right? We want to think about that kind of state data. Yes, this is what students are told overall for the cost of education, but what are we asking students to pay on our campuses? Um, and really inviting yourself to think about taking some of these broader ideas and really adapting and localizing it so that it speaks to the specific needs of your particular audience. 
The other thing I'll note about the problem, this section or highlighting the problem, is that it's not just important that you connect with your audience by working to really localize that information. It's also important to make sure they're really clear about the connections between the problem and the implications of what those problems might lead to. That's why highlighting not just a financial barrier, but really helping faculty understand that that $50 does matter. We have data that demonstrates that that $50 can really make a big impact, not only for the particular students in your courses, but in the culture that we're creating in our, um, in, um, our campuses and in our communities. So since we kind of talked about the problem, you'll notice here as we transition, we're then gonna begin to help faculty understand how can open be one of those solutions to address the problems that we've really worked through. Few of the problems, although of course those aren't every, um, every issue students are facing. Um, and as we consider the issues that we've sort of discussed, we're gonna then shift to talk about open textbooks as one way to address these topics. But before I go into open textbooks, um, what they are and how they might be helpful, I want to be clear that open textbooks are just one of many solutions that could assist in the challenges that we've been through. So I'm not trying to propose that open textbooks are a one stop solution, but rather, again, just a tool that you can place within your resource toolkit to address some educational equity issues, depending on what you're dealing with and seeing on your campus with your faculty colleagues and in your own classrooms. So to kind of fully understand what open textbooks are, we're really going to first by, start by talking about the open textbook model. And what this means is often when I talk about open textbooks, um, people have a real sense of where, where are these being written? How do they happen? How do they come into fruition? And so it's helpful to kind of start and really map a clear understanding of an open textbook model that has been happening for many, many, many years at many institutions. So, so this first model on the left, this actually is going to represent how we assume all publishing happens. Right? We have a publisher, that publisher invests in publishing a textbook. We have students who each buy one textbook each. And then, of course, that goes back to the publisher and that publisher pays royalties to the author, usually just a little tiny single digit percentage of those royalties to that author. So this is how we assume all publishing happens for textbooks, but there's another model. And this model is, instead of having a publisher, instead we have a college or university that publishes a textbook. Oftentimes, of course, this happens in the library. This was my experience. So KU libraries functioned as that publisher. Um, where, uh, again, they might have grants or support. And rather than invest in that textbook, what they do is they invest in the author and usually have funding up front in order to support the author or authors that are working to collaborate to create that textbook. And um, certainly there are sometimes other foundations or government consortia that assist in creating those grant funds, absolutely. Um, but overall, then that college or university supports the author who creates the textbook and then provides that textbook free of charge to students to be able to, to, to distribute. And I think this is really helpful because, again, it demonstrates that that model does, in fact, work. When we look at both of these models, I want to note that, that all of these publishing processes can be exactly the same in each model, including peer review, including copy editing, all of that can still be facilitated within the model that's happening on the right. So it's possible to publish a free textbook while also still respecting the efforts of the author, right? You'll notice that that college and author support can be very similar to what the publisher provides. This model or this more open model also has the potential of addressing inequity in traditional publishing models, whose stories are told, who gets to tell those stories, um, especially in a time where, and I know I'm, I'm um, preaching to the choir for you all, that there is growing legislation that's attempting to, to delimit or to limit, excuse, excuse me, more information about what textbooks should have. And so there's an increased worry that traditional textbook publishers may feel pressure to bend more to those bands as, as um, publishing continues to um, adapt or unravel. And so instead, the open model allows the university or that publisher and author to have more control rather than having to dilute content. Um, 
And also the reason that this slide is important is that it addresses the assumption that to get a free textbook, someone has to volunteer to write it, or they're in their basement for free, standing there kind of writing out their textbook and no one else has, has written it. There's no copy editing, there's no peer review, which is not necessarily the case. But there is one more thing that comes into play for both of these models, and that is the idea of copyright. Right? We know, of course, in theory, um, that if we want to assign a chapter from a book to our students, what we're supposed to do through copyright is pay a fee to get permission or a license in order to make copies of that chapter in order to distribute. And copyright is important, of course, in the model, that traditional model on the left, because without copyright permissions, the publisher would only really have to sell one copy of the book to one student, and then that student could distribute that book all over the place, right? So copyright is what um, you know allows us to understand the kind of permissions that are allowed and also allows the author to communicate, hey, these are my, my rights, all my rights are reserved. But, but books on the right in the open model also have copyright, right? The author still has the ability to communicate with an audience what their intent is related to the content of the book. But because in an open model, part of our intent is to make sure that book can be freely copied and shared, then traditional copyright would never be sufficient right? because we need something else in order for a publisher or the author to give textbooks a license that would allow us for it to be freely open and shared. We know, of course, that copyright is extremely important, but it wasn't intended to help people who want to openly share because copyright means all rights reserved. So it's insufficient because in an open model, we don't want all rights reserved. We want some of those rights to be reserved. And that's where the idea of Creative Commons comes into play. So Creative Commons is a nonprofit that created licenses to help people who want to share copyrightable intellectual property. So while copyright means all rights reserved, Creative Commons means some rights reserved. So it's a license that's on top of copyright. It helps us as authors or as folks who are adopting to have a clear understanding about what the author intent is for open, right? Because for open, while certainly open means free that can be openly shared, open means free plus certain permissions. And that's what Creative Commons really allows you to do. So when you see this symbol at work, and I know that you've seen it many times already, which we'll go over in a moment, it means that the creator of the work intends the work to be freely used and shared. So when we go back to this publishing model, the last thing the model needs this open model to make sense is a Creative Commons license right on top of that book here. Now, a quick note, I am not a copyright expert, right? and you might not be either, but I, you know, many campuses, and I'm confident you all as well, will likely have support usually in the libraries of folks who can and kind of assist in translating some of this information for you. So part of our goal, again, in the workshop is to recenter our sense of community and encourage faculty to utilize resources at their disposal. We also have resources in the Open Education Network to be able to assist. So Creative Commons is some rights reserved. So what are those rights, right? What does Creative Commons assist in communicating with or what does it allow? So again, when we say open, open means free plus certain permissions. And what Creative Commons grants you or can allow you to do um, is some or all of these things. So Creative Commons, again, will allow you to copy, share, keep, or use, right? It means you won't lose access after the semester ends, right? Um, it means that you can give it to anyone else, you can download it. But it also means Creative Commons also can allow an author, if they're interested, to allow folks to also remix or edit their content. In other, way, in other words, it can allow folks to create derivatives of the work. And we're gonna talk more about the significance of that in a moment, because it's where we see how open textbooks and open practices can really address some of these issues earlier, not just affordability, because of course, if you make the book free, of course, if they can keep it forever, it means that we've reduced that, we've addressed that affordability issue. But also when you allow works to be edited or slightly remixed, it can also address some cultural inclusive curriculum ideas that we'll talk about in a moment. 
because we can enable users to engage with the content in a variety of ways under Creative Commons licensing. So we then get closer to achieving more, more equitable learning outcomes. Right? So Creative Commons, free plus permissions, which include, can include some or all of these different components. And in order to help communicate more clearly some of that intent, there are four license components of Creative Commons licensing. So if you understand these four symbols, you will be able to comfortably and competently understand what the author intends of their work. And if you are interested in authoring, you can really start to ask yourself, what would I be comfortable with someone doing with the work that I've created? And so this first symbol on the left here, the little person, um, is CC BY, and this means attribution. So if someone has a CC BY license, they're letting you know, hey, you can keep, share, do anything you'd like with this work, but you need to give me credit, right? I want attribution for the work that I've created. Simple, makes sense. The second one is CC non-commercial, and that means you can't take an open or Creative Commons um, work with this license and then charge all of your students a dollar for it. Right? It means you cannot um, ask folks to pay for that content and someone uses this license component in particular to just remind you, hey, no, no, uh, no profiting off of this open work. That third component is CCSA and that CCSA means share alike and the share alike license means that they're fine with you, right? often creating a derivative, editing their work, remixing it, but you have to use the same license that they have on their original work. So if they have, you know, an NC license and an SA license, you have to have the same license on the derivative that you've created. And the last component is the most restrictive of all of these components, and that is CCND, which means no derivative. Um, in this work, in this case, a person would say, hey, you can keep, share, download, um, use my work, but I do not want you to edit or remix it, right? So it's, of course, then the most restrictive or, or the most kind of common that you would understand under normal copyright law. So if you understand these, you'll be eight, these four components, you'll really be able to understand any. And each of these four components can create a combination of six different licensees. Um, and so, of course, the one on the top hand left is the most open, a CC BY license is, again, you can do anything you'd like with the work, but you just have to make sure that you give um, credit or you give attribution. Um, and if you had, for example, let's, we'll do a, we know we all love a quiz, right? If you think about um, someone who would want you to give attribution um, and you cannot sell it, and they also don't want you to make a derivative, which of these licensees on the left or the right would be the way to communicate that intent? So they want attribution, you can't have money for it, you can't sell it, and they also do not want you to create a derivative. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Carl, that's that bottom right. That is kind of the most restrictive. And in fact, I like to mention it because it's one that you likely use all of the time if you use TED Talks in your class. Right. TED Talks are a great example of openly licensed, creatively common licensed educational materials. In TED Talks, they say, hey, you can use it, you can download it, you can share it, but we don't want you to take our TED Talks um, and remix them or change them or edit them in any way. So for my book, this is what I used because I used around 10% of content from a previously published open textbook. And that textbook had a um, CC um, share like license. And so what that meant is for me, I say, hey, I would appreciate some attribution. You cannot make money off of this open textbook and you're absolutely free to edit remix to create a derivative of that work. Um, you just have to make sure that you would use the same license. So another example. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of understanding about what we mean when we say open, and in particular, the important role that Creative Commons can play um, when we're going to create open materials or when we're going to adopt open materials, it's important that I think we answer some of the core questions that often come up about open textbooks. I'm going to pull you out briefly here before I transition into the allowing kind of watching over those common questions, which is a great section. So we started out in the faculty workshop really saying, what are some of the core problems that students are addressing around affordability and inclusivity in particular? And then we want to introduce them to open as a potential solution. But 
in order for that solution to make sense as something that can overcome the barriers that were mentioned, we want to make sure faculty have a clear idea about not only what open is, but the process of how open textbooks are created. And so that's why the models and really showing the kind of side by side models about how open textbooks can really come into fruition is helpful not only because it can help in creating an increased literacy, but it's also helpful in helping faculty visualize and help overcome some myths that many faculty have about um, open textbooks. So when you get questions or barriers around things like, is this promotable? You're really able, and other faculty you talk to are able to pull on the information you've provided by those models to say, well, hey, um, the creation of this book was done very similar to what a traditional publish, a traditional um, textbook was, would have been done or created through. And so that's why we should think about it for promotional materials. Um, and so that kind of solution section, again, is able to say, here's how it can overcome those barriers and here's why. This last section of the presentation is really great because it's going to help explicitly answer questions that many faculty might have, rather than wait toward the end of the presentation for faculty to bring up some of the issues that they might still have, you're going to explicitly address them in the presentation itself, and that's the kind of transition we're going to have to the latter half of the presentation. And these kind of common questions are ones that we get from faculty all the time. So um, I'll just kind of briefly address them now. They're likely questions that you have had for yourself or you might hear from other faculty members. And the first is pretty common, which I already answered for you earlier. Where do you find um, textbooks? Where do you find these open textbooks? Of course, the best place to look is the open textbook library. So like I had mentioned, the open textbook library is the most comprehensive catalog of open textbooks. Um, I believe there are almost a thousand textbooks um, in the open textbook library right now. And another great benefit of the open textbook library um, is that you have bun uh, tons of other faculty who have reviewed those textbooks. So not only are you locating and finding the textbooks, but you're, but you're also able to see what other folks in your field have had to say as they've in fact reviewed that textbook themselves. So there are around two thirds of all books have at least one faculty review. Um, another cool thing is the open textbook library is also starting to try and if they are available, link any instructor or supplemental materials into that open textbook library. So it really is a one stop shop to be able to search for what you might need. Another, of course, frequently asked question is are the books any good? Again, often this question emerges from the belief that we're kind of sitting in our basement, someone is kind of typing up their notes in a Word document and then sharing it out on their blog, right? Um, which, you know, I've read a lot of great blogs. Um, but when we think about, are they any good? Um, the answer is always, it depends. Just like any book, whether it's published through the traditional publishing model or an open model, it's going to depend. And really, we rely on your expertise as a faculty member to decide whether or not a book is going to be good or work for you or not. Of course, there's no universal rule. A great thing, though, about what this chart um, really shows you, though, is this is the kind of um, reviews that have been done in the library. And what you can see is that there's an overwhelming amount of, of um, reviews that give those books between a four and five star rating. It's important to note that the Open Education Network focuses on honest reviews also. So reviews that are done by faculty are not edited by anyone at the Open Education Network. They're not trying to seek quote unquote good reviews. They want honest reviews from faculty because they're using it as a mechanism to communicate with you and to communicate with others in the field. So even if a text doesn't live up to its expectation, an honest review can tell other faculty and the author what really needs to be improved. We've seen too that that open textbooks, just like textbooks published through a traditional model, are winning awards. So this textbook is an example. It's called Blueprints for Success in College and Career. Um, won an award, won the 2019, um, one of their um, TIAA um, awards, TAA, excuse me. And so beyond where, you know, they're, they're, it's, so again, it just sort of depends right, when we're thinking about whether or not a book is good. And beyond where you can find a textbook and about their quality, we also are always asked if there's a correlation between open textbooks and academic achievement. Right? So earlier on when we were talking about the problem, we looked at that survey where students noted, hey, I'm, I've had to fail a course right, because of open textbooks. But 
We also have research that shows us there is a real correlation between open educational resources and academic achievement. Um, this is an uh, this is the kind of representation of an article that that noted the results of a large scale study, almost 22,000 students that looked at the impact of adoption related to open educational resources. So what it looked at is changes in um, that that drop fail withdraw DFW right changes in drop fail withdraw after those courses instituted in open educational resources and what we notice is some really really interesting results because of this data right we can see that that in for all students there's an increase in grade their grade goes up and the drop fail withdrawal rate goes down of course that's really interesting right and it also makes sense because if we know students aren't able to afford the book or they're having to make choices when you give them the means um, when you give them those educational resources, it means they're able to participate in the economy of knowledge that's happening in the course. Okay. But really interestingly is that second, that second row, which shows Pell eligible students in particular, that almost 11%, there was an almost 11% increase in their grade and 4.43 drop in that DFW component. So we can again see the kind of real impact when we do institute open educational resources and we're thinking about the impact on overall academic success. So we can see then it helps move us closer to achieving um, educational equity and improving the academic experiences of students because not having to not having money to buy course materials can really, really make a difference. Now, we have to be careful, though, not to conflate open with other kinds of affordability initiatives. And if you all are like anything happening at KU, um, there are some attempts at trying to address or acknowledge the kind of affordability issues that are happening, um, especially since um, there was a recent study that showed publishers over COVID, you know, drastically increased the price of their online textbooks. I think it was by two to three hundred percent. So some of these problems are becoming exacerbated. Um, and and students are unfortunately being taken for granted one are there any ancillary materials are there instructor resources i i'm really sympathetic to this question in an era where um, some adjuncts are teaching five six seven courses and it can be a lot in order to create instructor resources on your own and just like commercial textbooks some open textbooks have ancillary materials and some don't here on the slide here, you notice that there are examples of places that can find ancillaries depending on your um, discipline, the, the, the specifics of your discipline. And again, like I'd mentioned, the open textbook library shows where those materials are accessible if they are available. I also like to mention that um, sometimes this can be a great opportunity, even if there aren't resources that are available. So in my department, for example, I adopted an open public speaking professional communication textbook, but there weren't any ancillary materials. So what I did with some of the grant money that I received from the library is that I used it as an opportunity to work with GTAs on pedagogy, on creating instructional resources. And so they worked together to learn how to create instruction, instructional resources. And also then we had those ancillary materials that we could share with other folks who were also integrating or using that open resource. So again, it kind of depends. Now, beyond what we've already discussed, there are other ways that open textbook can really improve student success. Um, we know, for example, that students who are at most risk of dropping out really need to see themselves as belonging, right? Um, and that even small barriers can really prohibit students from being retained within schools. I mention that because for me, educational resources are not additive to the campus experience, that they can really be fundamental in contributing to the culture and the environment that we're creating in our classrooms and on campus. So let's look at just a couple ways that open textbooks can help remove some additional barriers that can help students feel a sense of belonging. And honestly, for me and instructors as well. And those are the ways that Creative Commons licensees allows content customization, contextualization, other inclusive inclusive opportunities, and then opportunities for um, innovative pedagogy. So again, as a reminder, when we talk about the definition of open, we're talking about free plus permissions. Um, and so that free plus permissions can be helpful because when we talk about Creative Commons or when we talk about some of these additional components, 
Um, really, that ability to edit or remix is what allows the kind of floodgates of creativity to open, starting with the benefit or idea of content customization. So when we talk about content customization, um, we're really talking about the ability to take components of an already published open textbook and customize it depending on the specific needs of your students, your campus, and your curriculum. What we're noticing here on this slide is on the left, we have an open textbook that was written for a lower level statistics course. Um, but unfortunately, what a group of authors noticed was that in their um, curriculum around statistics, they were relying on spreadsheets a lot. Spreadsheets were part of the learning outcomes. And that first book on the left, while it was really incredible in terms of the content, it didn't integrate examples or apply the statistical information to spreadsheets. So what that Creative Commons allowed folks to do is to create a derivative on the right hill your notice customization of that content where they were able to keep a lot of content from the original textbook right they didn't have to rewrite a bunch of stuff about statistics that didn't need to get rewritten. What they needed to is change add or embed the components of their curriculum that were most worthwhile for students, which meant spreadsheets. So this is an example of customizing the content of a previously created open textbooks to meet the specific needs of students. Right? This really, for me, also relates to questions of sometimes accessibility or understanding, because we don't we then no longer have to take a hundred dollar textbook when we know there are many sections of it that might be outdated, that aren't working for students, that don't apply to the curriculum. And it's hard to tell students, just ignore pages 11 through 14, right? Um, or we're gonna apply this using something different, as opposed to what customization allows you to do, which means having much more seamless integration for students um, to be able to understand and meet the needs of your particular curriculum. Another thing that it allows us to do, which is also cool, open, is you're no longer sometimes required um, to just make do with one expensive textbook. Instead, you're now able to say, huh, maybe I have just a chapter from an open textbook that I wanna customize. Content customization doesn't require that you customize an entirety of a textbook. It might mean that you have a specific um, a textbook or a chapter of a textbook that you wanna integrate and customize to make it more specific or useful for your students. So content customization, you're also able to do content contextualization. And we see it through um, one of my favorite examples. On the left here, we have an introduction to sociology textbook that was created at Rice University through their OpenStax initiative. And OpenStax has probably one of the most prolific um, amount of open textbooks. But um, the right here you'll notice is a derivative. It is a um, introduction to sociology. You'll notice the Canadian edition. If you would in the chat, just think about why might it be important for a sociology textbook to be customized to a Canadian edition, as opposed to um, just assigning your students the regular introductions. I love that Canadians are more polite. Perhaps you want to kind of change the language, which content contextualization um, and customization would do. Any other reasons why, from a sociological perspective, we might want to contextualize some of the information for students? Sure, absolutely, right? Demographic differences. When we're thinking about the study of culture, we want to really be thinking about making sure it's specific to the sociological conditions of that geography, right? That that um, country. So the derivative, right, allows things which include spelling, measurements, but also to contextualize those sociological principles using Canadian examples. So again, when we think about um, why that would be important. Canadian students shouldn't have to learn sociology in a US context. So by making a Canadian edition, it allows students to learn within a context that they are familiar with. We don't universalize that context and assume it's going to be true for all students. Right? Again, we don't have to start from scratch. We're able to utilize things in a discipline that are already important, which is a huge difference from the traditional model. Um, when I talk to folks about writing textbooks, right, many of them will say, oh, I've never envisioned myself writing a textbook from scratch. And I say, well, you don't have to, right? Because Creative Commons doesn't allow you or doesn't require you to start from scratch. 
um, and to rewrite things, especially in textbook format, that may have been said over and over and over and over and over again. It doesn't need to be rewritten. Um, also, we can see that um, through Creative Commons and Open, there is a benefit to inclusion, diversifying, and amplifying voices. So open education can also really allow um, that kind of amplification of understood voices. And we're going to look at a couple examples about how scientists and anthropologists thought it was really important to consider the core curricular examples that were part of the textbook. So this is an, on the slide here. This is an openly licensed book that modified a science textbook. Um, and they found that what they really wanted to do was include rich indigenous examples, and they used the theme of a braid to do it. But it asked and said, hey, when we're looking at science books, they felt as though a huge gap was in thinking about its application to indigenous communities, for example. Um, and so this book provides a window into the vast different innovations and technologies of indigenous peoples who in particular live in the North, in Northwest North America. So the editors here were really hoping that the indigenous science examples would assist in inspiring deeper reflections about the underrepresentation of Aboriginal students within the sciences. So again, thinking about who is represented, who's part of our books, who's part of our examples, who's part of the curriculum, and who isn't. And we can also see it in this second example, um, which is the book called Explorations. And this book was kind of really meant to think about addressing disparities and equities. So the authors here use cross-cultural collaborations. So another huge benefit of open is also that um, many of the best open books that I've seen are collaborated. Um, so lots of people within a discipline came together in order to write a, a particular chapter and then create an open book that filled a particular need. The authors in this case were really motivated to create a learning resource that supported the goal of social justice within higher education from an anthropological perspective. So just like previously, really challenging and thinking about the underrepresentation of examples within our text. And then the last way, or the last thing I'm going to note on um, is how open education can really help invite us to think through innovative pedagogical strategies. And that's through the idea of open pedagogy. Now, um, if you aren't familiar, open pedagogy is a model where faculty engage students as co-creators of knowledge. So, so far, we've really talked about open textbooks or creating open textbooks under the assumption that it is faculty members who are experts in their field, of course, and writing the open textbook that becomes distributed. Open pedagogy really says, well, what if we invite students into the co-creation of those materials that we can then make open? So here's one example called an ecological approach to obesity and eating disorders. And one of the goals of a class was to engage students who divided up the chapters based um, and so on before we kind a, of do a particular ecological model. And then they wrote chapters together. They also engaged in peer reviews of those chapter. They gave feedback on those chapters. They did editing duties. Um, and so the entirety of the semester was about them learning, researching, and then practicing writing up their own um, in their own actual content that could be shared. I just um, played around with this last year in creating um, what we call the open public speaking pedagogy project because certainly when I wrote the public speaking textbook I realized that not only are, are the textbooks that we created often privatized but many of the educational resources or assignments that we used were also being privatized or kind of shared individually between faculty members so instead I said huh what if I worked with graduate students in our graduate pedagogy course to create open um, public speaking assignments, lesson plans, activities that we then shared through an open educational resource pilot grant using Manifold to make those resources available to other folks. So again, open pedagogy is that ability to work with students and also still sharing through Creative Commons license those resources with other students, community members, or instructors who might be um, focused on a similar content area. So lots and lots and lots of opportunities that this concept of open can really allow when we're thinking about addressing some of those major problems that we talked through earlier. And I really, really love um, this quote from Robin DeRosa, um, who, if you aren't familiar with her work, she's done some incredible work around open and social justice. Um, and she wrote of the benefits around open textbooks saying, quote, open textbooks save money, which matters deeply to our students. 
but they can also create a new relationship between learners and course content. And if teachers choose to acknowledge and enable this, it can have a profound effect on the whole fabric of the course. I've also um, can attest to this as I've had students more recently, when I adopt open textbooks, I also don't just adopt them um, and say nothing. I really work in the first few days of every course to talk to students why I selected op an open textbook to give them some transparency, how the kind of how the wheels work. And when I start to do that, I regularly have students come up at the beginning of class and thank me talk about their willingness to stay in the course, right? It begins to build trust and rapport when students feel like on day one that you have their best interests in mind when you're making decisions about the course materials. So now that we've talked about the problem and a little bit about open, you know, what can you do? Just a little bit about what you can do and then we'll spend the rest of the time with conversation and questions. And here's what we recommend. Take a look at the open textbook library, right? Um, consider an open textbook. Um, we'll invite, which I'll talk to you in a moment, you'll have an invitation since you attended this workshop in writing a review, which can of course really help other faculty members to see that posted review on the open textbook library if they're also considering adopting. Um, also adopt a book if it meets the needs of you or your students. So even if right now you're not in a cycle where you're looking to change the educational resources in a class, the next time that you are, um, the next time you're scheduled or you're, you're kind of surveying textbooks or resources to change your curriculum, just take a look at the open textbook library and make some choices about whether one or multiple books within that library might work for you. And raising awareness, talking with colleagues in your program and department. Um, every um, at the, the kind of usually the first faculty meeting of the spring semester, I often will send around the open textbook library link to faculty, um, or I'll mention it in one of our faculty meetings as, as my colleagues are beginning to think about the start of the next year, that fall semester, um, to just share it with them. Again, because most of the time folks aren't aware that such a large repository exists for, for um, textbooks. And like I mentioned, we're really gonna invite you to write a review. So if there is a textbook in the open textbook library that fits your class or your expertise, um, you of course have already attended the workshop and what, what it will look like is you're going to receive an email with a link to an online review form. And we suggest that if you're interested um, to support that you can complete that review by July 25th. Now, this isn't a hard deadline. We just usually recommend within six weeks of any workshop because as we all know, um, we have a lot on our plates. Um, and so if you receive, or once you receive that link and you see a book in the open textbook library that you think could be useful for a class, you can use it both as an opportunity to consider its implementation for your own course and also use it as an opportunity in order to complete the review. And the reviews are great. You use a series of kind of quantitative and qualitative opportunities for feedback. There are, I believe, 10 different categories that reviewers are asked to consider for the book. Um, and again, like I'd mentioned earlier, those reviews can be really, really influential in support and, and help other folks who are going to adopt. The review then, once complete, we post on the open textbook library under an open license. Again, your review would never be edited or changed. Um, and so you are, um, whatever you write will be what's posted um, on that. So I'm going to kind of pause this here. It's at the end. We transition, of course, to questions and engagement with that specific audience. But what you'll notice is as we worked towards really thinking through the solution of option and um, of open and considering all the different options that it provides, we end the faculty workshop with our strategy of engagement to get faculty to write a review. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that strategy. And so again, one thing we noticed in that workshop strategy um, is we really worked throughout the faculty workshop to engage, um, educate, and to raise awareness for faculty members. And the best way really that we're able to integrate engagement in particular is, like you noticed at the end of the workshop, asking faculty members to review an open textbook that's in an area of their expertise. And a great thing about this kind of engagement strategy is 
we know it works. We know that when we invite faculty to complete that review, that 74% of faculty do complete it. So it gives them an opportunity, not just to peruse the open textbook library, but to actually be able to engage with it and to review an open textbook within their field, which is helpful for themselves, but also really helpful to contribute to the review and the base of knowledge and information that's available for other folks within that open textbook library. So while 74% of faculty reviewed, um, you'll notice that when you find a textbook in the open textbook library, that this is what it's going to show you, right? You have an opportunity to look at the reviews that are embedded, both in kind of quantitative reviews, here's the amount of stars, but also in the qualitative feedback that faculty who are able to provide. So it's excellent when you're working to increase awareness to say, go check out the open textbook library. We have those different reviews that can assist you because it's other folks in your field who have read and reviewed the content of that book. So um, also helping then faculty to be able to engage by conducting their own reviews can be incredibly helpful. We do that then by asking them to participate and to use this kind of review criteria. And while I won't go over every criteria, you'll notice that it is 10 different categories that those reviews are able to look at when they're, when they're surveying a particular book. So you're not just getting one out of five stars. Reviews are a really well-rounded way to have people engage with the textbooks that are available. And again, while this was shown, this chart was shown in the actual presentation, it's worth noting here, and as a reminder, that the reviews faculty provide, those honest engagement reviews, are, are just that honest. And so it assists in helping us understand that quality question, but also helpful in helping folks remember that the Open Education Network isn't focused on good reviews. So even if a text doesn't live up to our expectations or what we would love, we want faculty to engage and review so that we're all aware about their experience with particular textbooks. So again, when we kind of think overall about the workshop strategy, we notice that we have the open textbook library where we're able to increase awareness. We utilize that faculty workshop to help bolster education around questions of student barriers and open. And then we invite faculty to review in order to get them to engage with the ideas and with the open textbook um, library. This is incredible here because it shows um, kind of faculty adoption decisions. And it really demonstrates that that workshop strategy just does that, it works. We know, the Open Education Network knows from hundreds of workshops, maybe thousands now, that when faculty engage, there is more traction with adopting in the future. So yes, we have, we see here in the graph that 45% of faculty do in fact adopt, which is incredible. But one thing we noticed that's even more exciting is that we have that 27% who is a maybe. And that group of faculty members, that maybe, means you have a group of faculty that might need additional contact or support, but are still thinking about and are invested in this kind of this process of, of um, open education and the adoption of open textbooks. Now you'll notice um, within, even embedded within that faculty workshop, that one thing we really value is um, the invitation for faculty to ask questions. Because when you talk to faculty about choosing open, remember that a key to overcoming some of the barriers that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is being open to those hard questions and the skepticism that faculty might bring. Um, you all know that as academics, we're really trained to ask difficult questions. So when we get questions from faculty members, we don't want to be defensive about those questions. We want to remember that not only are they trained, but those questions are an opportunity for you to be able to address some of the issues that they may be dealing with. So we always want to welcome hard questions with a few reminders. We don't want to demonize we're not selling faculty members anything. And we also have to be okay with I don't know. That was a really hard one for me to learn because even as you, uh, as you may have, have 
glistened today. There's a lot of information, a lot of knowledge around the idea of open. But the reason there's a lot of knowledge and information is because open isn't something new. There is a huge, long, nuanced, and in-depth history around folks and communities who are committed to open. So it's okay if you say, I don't know. And we, again, just want faculty to be the judge. We want to provide them information about what we know, provide them resources and support, and they're able to do what they will with that, that information. So um, we aren't just going to hypothetically talk about answering tough questions. We are, in fact, going to answer them. And so I'm going to kind of pass it back to Cheryl. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, if you have given uh, an OER training on your campus or at your institution, you've probably been faced with answering a tough question from the audience. And uh, they, we find it helpful to practice in a friendly atmosphere. <laughs> I, I tend to get tongue tied and turn red. And I, but if I'm more prepared, I feel better equipped to do it in front of a big audience. So this is a friendly, supportive <laughs> way to practice dealing with those tough questions. Um, and so Miggy and I are going to do some role play here. And uh, she is going to pretend to be uh, an OER leader. And I'm going to pretend to be the faculty member. So we're going to give you an example of a question on the next slide. Uh, and I'm going to ask Miggy this question, and she is going to give me her worst possible response. So Miggy, I hear that these books aren't any good. Is the quality the same as other textbooks? Um, I mean, they can't get any worse than regular textbooks. So definitely the quality is substantially better. I've never read an open textbook that uh, hasn't been 10 out of 10. OK. Uh, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with that answer because as a if if I were in Maggie's place as the the OER librarian, one, I'm not a subject matter expert. I don't have a PhD in these subjects. And I don't want to be making quality determinations for faculty. That's really up to them. And so I avoid making quality determinations at all costs. Um, I can point them to reviews, I can let them know that uh, textbooks are are you know, all of these things. But OK, so Maggie is going to do it the way I know she would actually do it <laughs> when I ask, answer this again. Maggie, I hear these books aren't any good. Is the quality the same as other textbooks? Carol, that is such a good question. And as the expert, as the faculty member, I would really invite you to go in the open textbook library and take a look. And in particular, really read through some of the reviews that other folks within your discipline have provided so that you can get insight into whether or not that book will work for you or not. Okay, let's on the next slide kind of break down some of the pieces of Maggie's second answer, her real answer, and, and what made that, um, you know, a good response or what makes a good response. Acknowledging that this is a good question, um, you know, relying on the faculty members expertise, and I think encouraging engagement is really that key part, inviting them to take a look for themselves, inviting them to write a review. Um, it, you know, all of these elements um, can help you deal with a, a kind of a dicey situation. Um, this next question, we're not going to role play, but um, in the interest of time, but we do want to kind of walk through um, some of the possible answers that you could give. And as we saw in the, the mentee comments about um, barriers, quality was one that was mentioned many times, time was another one that was mentioned many times, and faculty do have concerns about, you know, I'm busy with service and scholarship and teaching, how do I find time to adopt an open textbook? So this next slide kind of breaks down, again, acknowledging that this is a good question, it does take time. Um, I think encouraging them to do things incrementally, as as Maggie did um, in in her introduction um, in the previous section, uh, you know, 
looking at something in the next selection cycle or adopting just one piece of OER as a, maybe a supplementary material. Pilot is one of my favorite words. It often seems like a lighter lift. Um, it's not throwing out your entire syllabus and completely changing everything at once. They can test something, pilot it, see if it works, see if the students like it, and then grow from there. And offering that support, um, whether you're a librarian or an instructional designer, offering that support to faculty to help them locate OER. Again, the findability was a, a challenge and a barrier that was listed. Uh, you know, offering, um, I, I kind of present it as a spectrum of affordability where I start with OER because of the, the it's free to use, it's customizable, offers perpetual access. But if we exhaust all of those opportunities, then let's look at library license materials. And so you can kind of walk them through a variety of options and let them decide what's best for them. So um, those are just some, some best practices that we've found in, in handling tough questions from faculty and administrators um, or even colleagues. Um, Tough questions can come from <laughs> all corners. Uh, so now we want to split you up into um, breakout rooms in small groups and, and give you 10 minutes to really practice this yourself. All right. Welcome back, everybody. How did that exercise feel? I, I think it's a really effective exercise for trainers to go through. But uh, I'd be curious in the chat if you uh, don't mind sharing your experience. Were there some questions that you struggled to answer that kind of took you by surprise that were off script? Are there questions that you've also received from faculty that you're not quite sure how to answer? Feel free to, to type in the chat. Matt, it was fun, learned a few new things, didn't make it through many questions. Okay, that's good feedback for future train the trainer sessions to maybe give that one some more time. These, these uh, training sessions are always very iterative, seeing what works and uh, what, what doesn't, especially with the use of breakout rooms. Um, you know, sometimes um, trying to decide how to best do engagement in these training workshops. Uh, Menti can be a great tool, but sometimes it can <laughs> go haywire. Uh, with breakout rooms, sometimes you run the risk of, of people leaving. Um, with with chats, um, I think that tends to, to keep people engaged a bit more, or you can do the raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself. Um, let's see, I'm going to read back through some of these questions. Um, Teresa, I appreciate a safe space to get constructive feedback while networking. Ex that's the whole point of this exercise. I'm so glad. Ah, Rebel says ancillary use used to be hard, but now we have so much more. Yep. Um, it is improving, which is great. Ah, uh, let's see, hard, hard to answer the questions directly. Uh, Alexander, can you say a little bit more about what made it hard to answer the questions directly? Hi, this is Alex Rodriguez from uh, UTD. How you doing? Um, yeah, no, actually what it was is that when we, when we started speaking about it, um, one of the main things is, is that whenever we have any answers or any faculty that ask the question, what makes it hard to answer a question as broad as something, well, do you have any ancillary materials? Is, okay, what's the subject? Because sometimes some subjects are really easy to have and sometimes you can really pull down from a repository amazing materials that'll, that'll coincide with what they need. Um, and usually I've been noticing that happens with a lot of science and math. But for other ones, it's a little more difficult to do. And then also falls upon like, you know, I was saying for myself, upon the librarian to actually know the subject. Because I, you know, I could pull down a ton of math stuff, um, but I don't know if it's if it's what you're looking for. So it kind of you have to be very collaborative. So that's what I meant by the direct answer. You know, you can't really just be yes, I can. No, I can't kind of thing. 
So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it, that's a great point about the collaborative nature of this work and um, the importance of bringing in other subject experts, other liaison librarians, instructional designers to assist with faculty in answering these questions. Um, let's see. Uh, Claire says we discussed some of the grunt work, um, checking citations and links, good tasks for student workers. Uh, Jody reinforced what's on this slide here, deferring to the faculty content knowledge is critical. I, I really agree with that. Uh, Teresa said, uh, discuss how to assist faculty who are asking high level, very specific um, OER questions. Um, and, and I've gotten questions about specific OER uh, sites or referatories um, and, and the pros and cons. One of the exercises that we do in the Certificate in OER Librarianship is have people evaluate various um, referatories or websites like LibreTeX or Pressbooks Directory or OASIS or the Mason OER MetaFinder. Um, each one has has different strengths and and uh, drawbacks. Um, so being able to to know which ones to point faculty to can be um, can be useful. Um, I've had librarians tell me they were confused by the Mason OER MetaFinder interface. Like, where do I put the keyword? And so we tend to uh, embed the Oasis uh, search widget on our OER web pages. Let's see. Yeah, Ripple makes the point that university presses are a great source of uh, niche content in higher ed OER. And Claire, yes, the OER listserv is such a great resource. Um, uh, there's the OENs list. Uh, Creative Commons has a list. Uh, Spark has the Lib OER list. Uh, CCC OER uh, for community colleges has another great list. And um, I know members of this community are fantastic about sharing advice and resources. Um, Open Oregon has a great database of books um, assigned to particular courses. And um, Amy Hoffer is really amazing about saying, hey, this is what they're using in these courses. <clears throat> and, uh, and Dave emphasizes that the answer is often not clear cut, especially when we get into copyright. Um, it's often, it depends. And, um, you know that the tip on this slide to be okay with I don't know, but I'll try to find out for you. I think is a really good one. Oh, Sherry gives a, another uh, shout out to Open Oregon. Um, I will try to find the link to that unless somebody else beats me to it to share that in the the chat. It's a great resource. Uh, Gabby shares, we created some simple video tutorials for faculty that explain how to use and where to find ancillary materials for some of the major OER repositories. They, oh, thank you, Maribel, for sharing the Open Oregon link. Uh, and thank you, Gabby, for sharing the link to those resources. That's what I love about this community is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Other people have done so much amazing work in findability and, and resources, slide decks. Um, it, it's just fabulous to, to see all of the resources that have been created um, around promotion and tenure. Uh, I know the doers group uh, and and then Abby Elder at Iowa State customized um, the, what doers produced for promotion and tenure advice. Um, yeah, a Alexander points out it's amazing how the hive mind works together in OER. It, it really is, and it 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 benefits everybody. So. Kudos to all of you for your work and being willing to share and, and assist other people. Okay. 
Um, we've got about 30 minutes left, and uh, the next slide uh, asks what, uh, oh, actually, I think we're going to skip this part, uh, and focus on the, uh, what questions you have. Um, these can relate to OER or open textbooks in general. They can relate to how do I run a workshop? Uh, this is totally open to you. And um, Alexander modeled a great uh, best practice when he unmuted himself by sharing who he was for the ASL interpreter so that everyone has equal access to knowing who's speaking. Um, so feel free to raise your hand and uh, we can call on you or put the, uh, the question in the chat. Um, and I may call on some of the OEN staff to answer some of these questions. Does that, like, um, Michelle's, does the OEN have a spot for newsletters or flyers so we can share? I think they, the OEN's Google group would be a great place. Um, but Michelle, I suspect you're um, wanting to know if there's a repository of these that can be adapted. Yeah, so that's what I'm looking for. Does anybody from the OEN want to? to speak to that. Hi, this is Barb from the OEN. Um, we don't currently have uh, newsletters or flyers that you can uh, use, but this would be, if you are a delegate to the OEN Google group, this would be a great opportunity to crowdsource and answer and ask and see what our community can provide. And we'll keep this in mind. Thank you. I see Matt's question. Is OEN or anyone else uh, collecting disciplinary initiatives, like in the Disciplinary Association for Discipline in a Single Space? Uh, and explaining that disciplinary initiatives mean efforts by disciplinary associations to create OER books, journals, teaching resources. Um, I have seen some traffic on the various OER listservs about disciplinary initiatives. Uh, a good example is the, uh, the Math Association's uh, list of math open textbooks that they've approved. And I believe the Doers Group is doing some work in, in this area as well. It's, it's been a little tricky with the, the disciplinary associations Doers has found because um, they often rely on published materials as a, um, a fundraising mechanism. And so some of the OER initiatives among the, the disciplinary associations have been a little slower to get started. Um, but I'll, I'll also let anyone from the OEN or anyone else who's aware of disciplinary initiatives speak to that. Yeah, this is Dave Ernst. I'll say we're not collecting the initiatives, like we're not creating like an index list of initiatives like that. Um, although that actually sounds like a really good idea. But what we will do are obviously we're collecting the textbooks, for instance, that come from those initiatives. Um, we've done that many, many times where we find these initiatives, gather up their books and index them in the open textbook library. But that isn't completely what you're asking. So uh, interesting idea, though. Uh, Rebel mentions the Open RN project, which was funded by the uh, Department of Education OER grants. Um, I don't believe that's a disciplinary association um, effort, but it, it is uh, a great collection on, on one specific subject. And I understand that OpenStax is adding additional nursing textbooks in the next few years. I see Annette's question, does anyone have suggestions on how to set up a repository on my school's LMS? I want to create a central place for my faculty to go get OER info 24-7. Um, Annette, I've seen various approaches for um, 
places to provide OER information. Uh, at the University of Arizona, we do it on our website. And so we have a find OER page. We have a, a page supporting OER creation. We have a list of the courses that we're aware of that are using OER. Um, and the, the find OER page embeds that OASIS search widget. As far as a, a repository for housing um, OER, uh, there are different approaches to that. Um, some use their campus repository. Um, you know, others rely on uh, also you know, making it visible in the Open Textbook Library, OER Commons, Merlot, and other places. Um, are you are you speaking in that about kind of the technical aspects of setting up a repository? As as Dave mentions, um, if you are a Canvas user, there is the uh, Canvas Commons. Um, which I think functions well as an OER repository. We use D2L and that's been a little trickier. Um, Morgan mentions LibGuides and one of the awesome, th there are so many great LibGuides that are already existing on, on OER with all kinds of discipline by discipline resources. I tend to link to those rather than um, create recreate the wheel. Uh, with LibGuides, you can clone them. Um, so reaching out to another OER librarian who has already created a LibGuide uh, can be a solution and save you some work. And Alexander recommends checking with your campus Office of Information Technology about setting up a repository. I know some people have um, contracted with OER Commons to set up hubs and, and other spots, um, but that does cost money. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a low cost solution, yeah, I would check with your campus or library IT department about what kind of solutions are available. Does anyone else have advice? This is a great, <laughs> great, a uh, forum with with the hive mind online to, to share solutions. Thank you, everyone. I see Teresa asked a question about uh, working on building an OER community at her college. And we've begun to have regular monthly meetings. What are some ideas for agendas for monthly meetings? And what are some things other groups are doing to drive slash support OER on their campuses? Yeah, these, um, I think OER communities can take two different types of forms. Um, we have both an OER action committee, which kind of went dormant during uh, COVID, um, but involved our bookstore, IT, um, instructional technologists, and uh, let's see, who else? Disability Resource Center, student government. Um, you can include um, your campus uh, cultural centers, if you have a student success initiative or center, um, teaching and learning center, all of those are great partners for kind of an OER action group. And, and we found that really valuable um, when vendors tend to contact <laughs> individual uh, partners uh, with offers for you know various various things there's so many players in the course material marketplace and and some of them tend to go directly to administrators and uh, you know libraries don't find out about them until later but we find that um, having that listserv and that that means of communication can help us plug into you know so and so is offering a, a presentation and a demo of you know, this product, uh, okay, let's all attend together. So we're all getting the information at the same time and everybody's looped in. Um, the other effective thing we've um, started doing is, is learning communities. And um, 
you know, I, I tried doing drop-in OER sessions for about a semester uh, with set hours for people to drop in and ask questions and had zero attendees for, for an entire semester. I think um, OER tends to be less individual sometimes and more collaborative. And so people tend to want to set up meetings as a group. Um, but these, these learning communities have been a great way to surface people um, who we weren't aware of um, being interested in OER and have led to some of our best OER projects. Um, we partner with the campus unit that, that does faculty learning communities for the entire campus. And so we can leverage their marketing, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms and, and their advertising and their emails to to make people aware of our learning community. And uh, we've tried various iterations of it, um, some devoted to press books, some devoted to OER, um, some kind of focusing on open pedagogy. And uh, I've set up a Google Drive folder with those resources from those sessions um, that I'm happy to share with people. As far as ideas for agendas and monthly meetings, um, we've covered topics like, you know, how to find OER, what are Creative Commons licenses, um, what is open pedagogy, how do you do H5P activities in press books. Um, there, there's just a range of topics. And we try to have a mix of um, faculty led topics, you know, asking faculty and instructional designers, what do you want to learn about? Um, H5P has been a really popular one since that integrates with press books. Um, let's see, what else? I'd, I'd love to hear from other people what they're doing to drive or support OER on their campuses. I see some shared resources. Thank you, Rebel, for sharing the uh, Open Florida digital repository. And Kirsten, the Making Institutional Repositories Work. I hadn't heard of that book. That looks great. Ah, Jody uh, references Pakula's uh, learning circle model. And uh, Karen Pakula did a great session for uh, the OEN Summer Summit, I think two or three years ago, about learning circles. That really is a, a fabulous model. And it's been fascinating to see different faculty from across campus um, who wouldn't maybe ordinarily interact, um, get together and share solutions and, and uh, and really be able to support each other. And this summer we tried something a little different and just had scheduled OER work time where we said, okay, we're gonna be here for this hour each week and um, we're going to be available to answer questions, but also feel free just to turn off your camera and use that hour set aside to work on any OER project that you have. Um, I partner in our learning community with the, an instructional technologist um, since we, uh, the library and that unit co-pay for uh, our Pressbook solution. Uh, it's been fabulous to leverage their expertise and, and their campus contacts. So that's been really good for us. Rebel says uh, they focus on a hot topic and a particular course to find content. And Rebel says, in another statewide group, we have one person share about their efforts at their local institution. Uh, yeah, this, uh, I think depending on your context, whether you're at a system or a consortia or an individual campus, um, there's so many different ways you can, you can arrange these learning opportunities. Alexander says, in most of my meetings, I have always made a cheerleading segment. 
as OER is a tough fight for singular librarians or new groups. All work and no play. I think that's a really good point to have time set aside to celebrate wins. Um, you know, we can also talk about challenges, but celebrating those wins is so important. Matt suggests getting into your school's professional development conference. Yes, uh, we uh, have made connections to make sure we're integrated into new faculty orientations, um, training sessions for onboarding faculty, any kind of professional development partnerships you can make. Love that idea. Alexander suggests uh, getting in touch with departmental deans to get into faculty meetings uh, to get introductions made. Uh, for, for us, that is often more successful to ask for time on departmental calendars or college calendars than to invite them to come to a, a standalone workshop. Um, unless we use the OEN model of workshop where we pay them a stipend to attend, then we can get um, uh, attendance, good attendance, but we typically don't have a budget um, to for workshops. And so, yeah, those departmental, departmental meetings can be a really good mechanism. And also allows you to really tailor your presentation to particular subject specific OER resources. Joe shares uh, about a Title III grant that funded adoption, adaptation, creation. Uh, the grants over, um, oh yeah, whenever someone announces a new open text, making sure the relevant department knows about it. Um, I think that's a great tip. A lot of uh, OER releases are shared on the various OER listservs, and I try to forward those to our liaison librarians in those subject areas and ask them to share them with their faculty. Um, one of our liaison librarians has added an OER section to her subject libguide for veterinary medicine. So she has OER uh, resources specifically called out, which I would love to see other liaison librarians do. Are there other questions? I appreciate you all sharing your brilliant ideas from your campuses. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next slide. And so this is another Menti uh, activity. And I think this is a really valuable step to take in any kind of training. And when I attended uh, textbook affordability conferences um, from the by the National Association National Association of College Stores, the last day they had us, had us actually write down what steps we were going to take and self-address an envelope. And they mailed those steps to us as a reminder. Um, I encourage people in workshops to you know, add a note to your calendar, just one little thing that you can do to move yourself forward with OER, whether it's to reach out to somebody, to follow up, um, check out the many resources shared today, uh, come up with monthly agendas. Yes, update OER research guides. Um, highly encourage you to, to look at what other people have done with OER lib guides and research guides. There's some great examples out there. Oh, I love that you're um, going to apply this presentation to a ses session this fall at your college. Ah, revisit your OER action plan to see how things have changed since you wrote it. Uh, I suspect this person is a participant in the Certificate of OER Librarianship. Uh, the action plan is a culminating project. And um, we have action plan examples and samples that we can share that you can adapt.
Ah, going back to paying for stipends for reviews now that you have a funding stream. Uh, money is always helpful <laughs> to <laughs> encourage participation for sure. Excellent. Uh, I see several people mention offering workshops and websites and going beyond the workshop ideas for extending engagement and and this community is the source of a lot of really great ideas for engagement um ku did a, a session in a previous um oen summit about their faculty uh textbook heroes program and uh that's a great video to track down uh talking about how they recognize donors and students and faculty and administrators and you know write uh not only present them with the the award which people can put in their tenure and promotion packets but going beyond that to to write a letter just to the person's department head and the person saying thank you for your work and this is the impact that it's made um I see that Barb has posted the information on the certificate in um, open education librarianship. Thank you. And and Dave reminds um, that future sessions this week will be on open pedagogy uh, and learning about running faculty learning circles focused on open pedagogy. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Barb, for posting that textbook heroes recording. That was a fabulous session. I got a lot of ideas from that. Uh, and and I see somebody posted about, um, you know, developing skills like grant writing. Um, that's become an increasingly large part of OER work is is figuring out how to fund OER creations. Uh, this slide emphasizes something that that Alexander shared about celebrating wins, big and small, and uh, you know sharing those on social media, um, sharing those with your administrators and coworkers so they know about the the great work that's being done. And um, there are some great examples um, from members of this network. Um, I'm thinking of. Abby Elder at Iowa State, who produced a graphic about um, how their bookstore and library collaborated on course material initiatives and the, the total savings and number of faculty that they'd impacted. Our bookstore directory, director actually saw that graphic and said, we need to do that here. Uh, and so they did and have been using that in presentations. So, uh, you know, uh, a big part of uh, OER program management is, is really sharing um, the impact of the work that we're doing. So I love that slide. Next slide. Okay, so um, uh, as we said at the beginning, the, um, the slides and the transcripts and the recording will be posted to the OEN hub at a later time and also to the OEN's um, YouTube channel for the uh, OEN Engage uh, event. Um, Maggie shared the URL for a lot of different uh, resources. And we still have a little bit of time. So um, happy to stay online and and sh continue to share ideas and answer questions crowdsource challenges a big thank you to everybody for attending i know it's it's really difficult to carve out that three hour chunk and you know you probably have competing meetings and emails and sarah's amazon prime day <laughs> so hopefully you uh, got your orders already submitted um but uh, thank you for, for being with us today and, and, and being engaged and, you know, doing this, this sharing. Maggie, do you have any uh, final words? 
I don't think so. I just wanted yet to reiterate that we're so grateful to have you all who've joined us today. And just like Cheryl mentioned, the slides and transcripts, everything will be posted on that community hub. So we're just so grateful to have been able to spend a little bit of time with you each today. Thanks for the comments in the chat. Thank Can you. We...